Welcome to the Federal Milk Market Order 33 update. Uh, this is Dr. Lawrence Jones with Farm Institute and I'm recording this on September 7th, 2022. This program is made specifically for Novus AgriScience in connection with Balchem. In this program, I want to try to give you an idea of where I think the industry is headed and some of the influences on it. So let's start by looking at statistical uniform prices for order 33. And the last data we have are for July, and that was down about a dollar eight cents from the previous, and that was reported in Cleveland at twenty-four dollars and seventy cents. So this has been a nice run up, you know, through the last eighteen months or something like that. So when we look at your statistical uniform prices, historically speaking, uh, you've been about thirty-five percent class one, about ten percent class two. 35% class three and 20% class four. But we can divide these top two into three and four because all of class two is actually based on class four and class three is a 50-50 blend. So when we get all done in order 33, again, generally, you guys do a lot of deep pooling, but you're about 50% class three, 50% class four in prices. And you'll want to keep that in mind as we see how these different prices are changing over time here. So let's look at what uh, drove those prices up. And this is a close of the class three and class four prices. Again, class three is going to be in blue here. Class four is the more uh, orange color. So both of these ran up, but the class four stayed above class three and uh, they've really diverged here in the last two months with class three coming down, class four going up. And remind ourselves that class three is really driven by cheese and class four is re really driven by nonfat dry milk. So what we've seen is an increase in nonfat dry milk prices and you know, kind of a uh, recently declining uh, cheese prices. Let's dig into this class three price a little bit. The last was 2010. That was down for somewhere around 25, 21, but way up from last September, 1651. So we're gonna consistently see this theme that uh, prices ran up from about January through June sometime, and then been slowly coming down. And right now, Class three would look like it's flattening out or increasing just a little bit uh, for the next couple months. And class three is made up of fat and protein. So if we look at these uh, fat prices. The low was $1.94 last September. This was $3.40. Looks like that they're gonna come up a little bit, but they're gonna remain fairly strong. Uh, generally, if we can have fat prices over $2, uh, we think this is pretty good. So it looks like you know fat prices are going to be elevated above that $2 number here for quite a while. Protein is a little bit of a different story. Our benchmark on protein is around $3. Uh, we were up to $3.87 again back here in, in midsummer. Uh, we're at $2.14, which is actually the low for the last year. It looks like it might even drop down to as low as $1.86 uh, before it begins to come up. And right now, the futures would suggest by first of the year, it might be back up to that $3 number. But that all depends on what happens to cheese here in the next couple of months. So we'll stand back and look at the big picture again for the next uh, few months. Class 3, you know, it's coming up. Uh, it's got a bit of a blip in it here in November and December, and we'll see if we can hold that. Uh, but class four is going to stay above it, but it's also going to be coming down. So both of these are going to kind of end up in this 21, you know, plus or minus a little bit, uh, you know, by midsummer next year. One of the things that I kind of like to take a look at is we had this kind of bull market run from the first of the year up through uh, July. And the question is, you know, was it predictable or was it not predictable? And so this is a graph of what I call the spot market, which is in blue. So that's this one here. And the actual national dairy sales report. Now the spot market has a few offsets in it. So again, it's not exactly, but you see that these trend very closely together. I mean, yeah, there's some bobbing around, but basically the spot market, you know, 
is going to tell us when this was flat, it's going to tell us when there's an uptrend, tell us when there's a downtrend. And so the idea is if we keep an eye on the spot market, it does kind of give us an idea of where the uh, overall prices are going. And it's fairly strong. The uh, predictive value is uh, amazingly strong here. So there are a couple of things that uh, are kind of bother me about the industry right now. And so we'll kind of touch on these. And one is these cheese stocks. Uh, so overall cheese and cold storage has been rising, you know, 3.7% on an annual basis. And we've just reached, you know, 1.52 billion pounds in cold storage, a very, very high number. So the first question uh, that always is a pushback is yes, but you know we've got more demand, and so what I do is I calculate the cheese stocks to use, which you know we have to estimate demand, you know, over how much cheese is made and how much ends up in cold storage, and kind of the difference is use or disappearance. And this is bounced around, and I've got two critical numbers. One, a very low at 36 days of uh, surplus cheese, and the other is very high at 40 days of surplus cheese. And we tend to stay between that 36 and 40. Now, you know, during you know pandemic, we went way high. Uh, in 2019, we had a very few cows, so that uh, brought us down. But look at what's happening right now. Uh, we've just bumping this 40 pretty hard. And so the question is, you know, can we keep putting cheese in cold storage? Do we have to uh, do something to reduce the amount of cheese that's there, you know, unless people start uh, consuming a lot more. But right now this uh, stocks use ratio is, you know, flirting with this 40 days pretty hard. So a number I was just kind of playing with here is, uh, you know, what happened in the last year? And so we added about 73 million pounds of cheese and cold storage in the last year. And if we go back here, we can see the increase is, you know, fairly substantial. And if we take a, an assumption of there's 10 pounds of milk needed for a pound of cheese, you know, that's 733 million pounds. Uh, just put that on a per day basis. And then if we look at the USDA numbers uh, across the last year, milk per cow average 65.7. So what that is telling us is that the surplus cheese was made by 30,575 extra cows. And so the first thing that I looked at and said, wow, you know, you're telling me that 30,000 cows, so, you know, contributed to all this surplus cheese, and that's probably about right. And so if we add three 10,000 cow dairies in a year, you know, that adds significant cheese unless we can uh, figure out how to get the demand up. But if we go back and just kind of do some other math, you know, we average 9.4 million cows. We take these cows away, so maybe the right number, you know, is 9.37 million cows. So we go back to our cow numbers. Uh, so that's the green line right here. So during the last year, we've actually lost cow numbers. We went from 9.48 down to 9.416. Again, uh, they get really concerned when people talk about the year over year decline in cow numbers. Uh, when a year ago was what I would call unsustainable and now we're down to sustainable numbers, that's a good thing, not necessarily a bad thing. But if you go back and look at this green number, you know, we're climbing off of this uh, pretty high. And it's interesting how this kind of ties together on this green number, which is basically the end of 2021. And we go back and look at these cheese stocks, you know, we were flat. And it's only when we started increasing cow numbers now that we've increased cheese stocks again. So I think there's a, a lesson here. More cows ends up in more cheese and cold storage. More cheese and cold storage ends up in lower prices. Now, another thing that uh, I wanted to calculate for you guys is off of the uh, USDA cattle inventory reports. This came out on July 22nd, so it's a little bit uh, old now, but it only comes out one or two times a year. So the first thing that's been pointed out by a few people is that uh, the inventory of cows in this report is 9.45. Now remember that uh, uh, the lat latest numbers from USDA were, were 9.416. So that's 34,000 cows difference between the two different uh, reports that came out. So there might be a chance that USDA and the milk 
production report actually raises their numbers up to this 9.45, and that would be uh, reasonably bearish for the industry. Now, the other number that's calculated on here is this 3.75 million heifers that are over 500 pounds. Remember that number. It's over 500 pounds. So I was, did a little bit of math here, which is if you take 3.75 and multiply it by 2, because, again, about half the heifers are under 500 pounds, half are over, that says we've got 7.5 million heifers. We take 7.5 and divide it by the number of cows. It turns out we have 0.8 replacements per cow. If I go and analyze the number of herds, that's the number I keep coming up uh, generally. Is uh, In the old days, we used to have one heifer per cow, but now we've uh, got it down to uh, 0.8. This actually gets us a 40% call rate. Half of that number is how many cows we can replace a year. So 40% call rate is generally sustaining herd size. What I keep hearing in the industry is we have a you know, short number of heifers. Heifers are down year over year. We have enough heifers to have a 40% call rate and maintain herd size. So to me, heifer inventory is not a critical issue. I wanted to touch on the global dairy trade auction for just a second. Uh, this has been down you know, fairly consistently, and then all of a sudden we got an increase in session over session. So we're up 4.9%. And, you know, we see whole milk powder is up 5%, cheddar is up 1%, uh, butter is up 3%, skim milk powder is up 1.5%. And I just have a really tough time knowing what all this means. There's just a whole lot of numbers, and it's like, what does that mean? So I built this new table here. What this is, is this is this session, this is the last session, and the change. And so the top part of this is basically the numbers that you're seeing over here to the right. You know, butter came up about seven cents, uh, cheddar came up about two cents, non-fat dry milk came up, you know, about two or three cents. But what does that all mean? So first off, I took uh, whole milk powder and tried to convert that into a milk price per hundred pounds of milk. And so it would suggest to me that the world milk price is about 1967. And that came up a dollar five on uh, this last trade. But that's significantly below where our prices are right now. And so if we think we're going to export a bunch of milk into the world market, uh, we may not be seeing you know, particularly good prices. This is the class three and class four based on the global dairy trade. And so what's interesting to me is class three came up just 21 cents. Class four came up $1.82. So all of this change in the global dairy trade was supporting class four. Class three is just not uh, very strong here with cheddar coming up just a little bit. And so if I did that as a 50-50 blend, uh, again, you guys are about 50% class three, class four. That says that overall this global dairy auction, you know, should support milk prices up about a dollar, dollar oh two. Uh, now, will we actually see that translated into U.S. prices? I'm not uh, sure, but it does tell us kind of where the global market is going. It's, it's coming up a little bit and it's mainly in class four. Again, to stand back uh, just a little bit, uh, this is a table that I put together. I now call this budgeting without basis. What that means is, for example, soybean meal I have at 404 for the next year, but uh, that's on the board. That's not you know with basis. So you're going to have to add you know like sixty dollars to uh, figure out the on-farm price. Corn is around 240 for the next year. And then I calculate this energy protein index, which is eight pounds of soybean meal, eight pounds of corn meal. It kind of gives me an idea, you know, of what uh, off-farm purchases are. So that went down about a penny a cow a day. So the uh, soybean meal coming down actually brought down the uh, off-farm purchase cost. Now here's our class three is running about 2038 for the year. Class four is a little bit stronger at 2196. And again, we can do that as a 50-50 blend, uh, which is more what you guys see is 2117. And that came up 11 cents a hundredweight. 
Uh, so what I do every day is, is try to figure out if dairy margins uh, improved or got a little tighter. If you're interested in getting this uh, table basically uh, every day that the market is open, send me an email at this farminstitute at gmail.com. I send this out uh, free of charge and uh, I'm happy to add anybody to that mailing list that has an interest in it. So this is uh, the dairy margin I calculate, which is this same thing except for an 80 pound herd. Uh, so I want to put it on a per cow per day basis. So it allows me to see, for example, that dairy margins, you know, kind of peaked back here on June 8th. You know, they were down the low point at, uh, you know, October 8th, somewhere in there, and they'd come down, you know, fairly uh, significantly, about two and a half dollars. And they've been climbing just a little bit here. They've, they've bobbled around a, a little bit, uh, but uh, we've seen, a, you know, an improvement from where we were early August. Three things uh, impact this. Uh, one is the corn price. You know, corn was up here 260, 280, and then we came down this uh, 220 to 200, but uh, here we're kind of beginning to come up a little bit. Soybean meal uh, has really been running this 390 to 420, uh, but it's tending down. That's because Argentina is trying to uh, corner the market, and they did some price fixing and uh, currency fixing yesterday, which has got a lot of downward pressure on the bean uh, contract at this point. And then the other is the 50-50 uh, blend milk price. As I said, the actual milk price you know, was coming down and then it's kind of bopped around here uh, trying to decide if we're going to see an increase or not. And again, these prices all have the speculative uh, part of the futures built into it. It doesn't uh, necessarily suggest the fundamentals, but uh, you know, as future prices go up due on speculation, it's going to be reflected here. Just a few words on uh, drought uh, and uh, water situation uh, because that's become a big, big issue. And so this is a four week change in the drought monitor. So it looks like you guys have probably gotten just a little bit uh, better, you have one class improvement, but this Western Corn Belt has actually gotten a bit dry. You can see all this rain uh, kind of around this Texas area and the Southwest monsoon that uh, was very strong this year. But an area that's particularly dry is this eastern New York, uh, eastern, you know, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island has been very, very dry out here. And we look at the, the gray satellite, uh, the root zone moisture, and it looks like you guys have got quite a bit of uh, moisture here. And again, you can see these hot spots that are dry and then this area that got uh, a lot of moisture here just recently. And what's the next eight to 10 days look like? I know you guys are right in the middle of corn silage harvest. So Michigan looks like it's slightly above uh, temperatures, which is great. There's no early frost coming. And then in the uh, precipitation about near normal. So it should be you know, pretty typical corn silage harvest uh, season. So I thought I would just do a quick summary. Um, so in my opinion, class four is stronger than class three. Everything I'm looking at is pointing to class four staying stronger than, than class three. You know, within uh, the component numbers, you know, the fat prices are stronger than protein. And, you know, as long as butter stays strong and uh, cheddar cheese is a little weaker, that's going to remain the, the case. Now, here are some things to just kind of contemplate here. There are huge cheese uh, stocks, you know, that cold storage report at 1.52 billion pounds. To me, I just keep shaking my head at that all the time. Our cow number is really short. We keep reading a number of things in popular press, you know, cow numbers year over year are way down, but, you know, are they really short if compared to where we are with demand? You know, is there really a shortage of heifers? You know, to me, the heifer Market looks like it's about a 40% call rate. I mean, we ought to be able to maintain herd sizes at a 40% uh, call rate. Uh, the slaughter data would also suggest that we're at a 40% call rate, which is just kind of maintaining size. You know, but we're maintaining size, you know, about 9.45 million cows when really we ought to be, you know, more like 9.40 or a little lower given where the demand is. Now, the other is this is just a world grain market. So as we look at, you know, locking in 
feed prices for the next year, just remember that it is a world grain market. So Argentina you know, fixes their currency exchange for the soybeans. Uh, then all of a sudden the um, market just uh, you know, collapses on soybeans. Russia today is uh, wanting to renegotiate the Ukraine uh, wheat deal, and all of a sudden, you know, wheat's up 50 cents today. So it, uh, a little bit of news internationally just really does rock uh, the feed prices on farm. So I want to thank you for uh, listening to this, and I know everybody's uh, kind of in the middle of uh, corn silage harvest, so be safe out there. Corn silage harvest is a time when, you know, everybody gets in the corn haze and tries to get a lot of work done in a very short amount of time.